good news, we're stepping out into the great outdoors. It is truly great to be back. As spring blossoms and the country reawakens, we'll be bringing you the best, the brightest, the most beautiful stories from the heart of the Scottish countryside from now until the end of June. Today, I'm at Tentsmuir National Nature Reserve in Fife, and later I'll be finding out just how lockdown has affected this spectacular place. But first, here's what else is coming up on the programme. Arlene's searching for the winter visitor that made a big splash. Oh! Wow. There That's it is. a big one, just as we said that. <laughs> Life after Brexit. How's it working out for Scotland's farmers? It's a massive, massive impact on many of our exporters. We're only putting a small percentage across now to what we used to do because of the, the friction that's now there. And homeschooling. We meet some early adopters. Our life was up at Loch Core and we just lived it. And a lot of our education was actually outside as well. This is Tentsmuir National Nature Reserve. Sitting at the mouth of the Tay Estuary, it's the most easterly point in Fife. The vast expanse of shifting sand is cradled by a massive dune system and surrounded by a pine forest, a haven for all kinds of wildlife. And with the ongoing movement restrictions and stay local messages, it's become more popular than ever with people too. Witness to this huge influx of humans is Reserve Manager Marika Leith. It's not only just an increase in visitor numbers like all over, but um, we're also seeing a more consistent increase. So like obviously the weekends and holidays are busy anyway, and they've gotten busier. We think it's probably doubled, but like just during the week on a normal Wednesday, even if it's a bit rainy, like, you just, you're always going to see someone. So why do you think they're coming? I think they're coming for a mix of things, like everyone's just at home to stand, they need to get out and about, so they're coming out for walks, they're cycling, getting their exercise, but then also it's just like being out somewhere fresh. And I think it's such a nice special open place, you can come out, look at the beach and the sea, and you just feel like you're away from it all for a bit. The increase in visitor numbers has led to new jobs on the reserve, helping keep people on the right track. From September last year, we took on an extra member of staff to cover the weekends in particular. So they were out just making sure people weren't parking in front of gateways and things like that. Um, and then we're going to be getting another seasonal member from mid-May onwards. So just someone to be there, be present during the weekends and speak to people as well and just talk about how to enjoy it responsibly. So what sort of message are you telling people? Um, right now we're trying to focus on the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, so like if we're going to have big numbers of visitors we need them to be doing responsible access when they're coming out. So if you looked that up before, we're sharing it on social media as well. And also during the ground nesting bird season, dogs are lead on the reserve, so that'll be from April to the end of August. And just following on-site signage and just actually adhering to it would just make a big difference. And are people generally quite responsive to your message? Kind of, yeah, it definitely helps if we have people there in person as well to back that up. So I think that's where the seasonals will really come in and make a difference. It's early spring, so what kind of wildlife can people expect to see if they come here? Well, we've got the classics, we've got the seals out, we've got the skylarks singing, meadow pipits, and also we're on the hunt for the butterflies now. So we've got the peacocks, um, I've seen some small tortoise shells, and also I'm looking out for my first orange chip. What is it you love about here? It's just the place itself, everything about it. It's just really special, like, and it changes every day. So, like, everything's different. You can come back in a couple of weeks and the currents have changed, the sandbars have changed, and it just looks completely different. I couldn't agree more. This is a truly amazing place, and all the more so thanks to the efforts of Marika and her team. Since we were on air back in December, of course, Brexit has happened, and that's meant a bumpy ride for some of Scotland's farmers. Well, earlier I caught up with Martin Kennedy, the president of the Scotland Farmers Union, to find out what's happening. <laughs> 
Do you think they're getting fed? Yeah. Every time you go near the box, they come over. <laughs> Here at Lurgan Farm in Perthshire, Martin and his daughter Katrina are incredibly busy lambing and calving. So Martin, that's just been born, yes? Yep, that's just born. Looking good, eh? That's just born about an hour ago, so it looks like it's getting up and had a bit of a suck already and hopefully it'll get more later on, keep its belly full. But as well as a new generation of sheep and cattle, Martin has to deal with a new set of issues, the aftermath of Brexit. Scottish farmers have had to deal with uh, new rules with exporting to Europe and Northern Ireland. So what's the impact of that been? It's a massive, massive impact on many of our exporters. We're only putting a small percentage across now to what we used to do because of the, the friction that's now there. To put it into perspective, here are some figures for UK exports to the European Union, comparing January this year to January 2020. Beef was down 92%, pork 87% and whiskey 63 The coronavirus pandemic is of course partly to blame, but new export barriers have played a significant role. Now we have export health certifications on all products before they can be exported. And it's got to be vet checks, it's got to be physical checks, that paperwork's been done correctly, and border control checks. All these things cost time. The biggest thing it causes is delays. What's particularly frustrating for farmers like Martin is that EU producers sending goods here won't have to meet the same standards and restrictions until next year. It's completely unfair in our producers in Scotland and the rest of the UK. It makes the industry feel uh, completely undermined. We're going to have products coming in without any friction from Europe into the UK. We can't export, it creates an oversupply, that then depresses the price for our products and it makes it very hard for us to maintain a, a viable agricultural um, future. We always knew Brexit would affect all of us in many different ways. And right now, our farmers seem to be taking the brunt of it. So, does Martin have any cause for optimism? I think this is a short to medium term hurdle we must overcome. But longer term, I'm certainly optimistic because now we can actually develop things like a future agricultural policy that's fit for Scotland, rather than being tied up to a one size fits all regime across 28 different member states. We want to produce our food locally, sustainably, and with the climate change targets in mind. And here on Lambert, we'll keep you posted on how things develop as Martin and the rest of us navigate these tricky post-Brexit waters. As we heard earlier, many of us have been making more of our local rural spaces, and wildlife spotting has become a popular pastime. Back in February, Arlene visited the banks of the Forth to meet a lady whose passion is helping us understand one of our less common marine mammals. Catching sight of a whale from our coastline has, up until now, been extremely rare, but I'm glad to say things seem to be changing. I've come to the Fife Coast, told to bring a pair of these, and I'm hoping to spot my first one. Guiding me today is Lindsay McNeil, She's set up her own whale sighting group on social media, collating information from all over in an attempt to identify and track individual humpback whales. It's quite a calm day, so is it easier to spot them on a day like this? Yeah, definitely, um, because the blows are kind of linger and it's like the sea is kind of like glassy. When it's really choppy, it's really hard to see the blows. Oh! Wow. There it is. a big one, just as we said that. <laughs> Identifying individual humpbacks is done by looking at the tail fluke. Lindsay says the scratches and markings are as individual as a human fingerprint. She's been whale watching since 2017 and matching her sightings with photographs and whale catalogues is a skill she's had to develop. The first match that I got was 2018 and the whale's tail had a, like a Y on it, so it was really distinctive. And I was just looking through and I seen this photo and I was like, 
looks really similar. So I sent it to a few other people that knew what they were talking about and they were like, yeah, it is. So it was the first UK match Arctic feeding grounds that the wow. UK had ever had. So I was like, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> um, so I just got like obsessed by it. Hairdresser Lindsay's salon had been closed during lockdown and it's given her more time to continue her detective work. In particular, identifying the whale that's swimming around the 4th today. So the whale's been here since the 30th of January. Um, he's got a barnacle on his dorsal fin. So the local kids in Fife have nicknamed him Barney. He's just here feeding on sprat. Um, the fishermen have said that there's like lots of sprat around just now. We also have herring. So that's what's probably drawn them in. After Barney's arrival, Lindsay's powers of observation kicked into high gear when she looked at pictures she'd received for her catalogue taken on the West Coast. And I just looked at it and I was like, I really recognise that whale, like the barnacle like on the, the tip of the dorsal. I was like, I know that, I've got a picture of that somewhere. Um, so I sent it to a few friends and they were like, yep, yeah, it's a match. Mm -hmm. So that whale's here now and was in call in August last year. Barney had spent last summer on the west coast and made his way round to sea in the new year on the east. This is possibly the first ever recorded sighting of the same humpback on both coasts. That's thanks to Lindsay. Oh. 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 Barney! Oh my God! <laughs> oh my God! And her enthusiastic social media posts have encouraged new whale watchers out to enjoy the extraordinary sight of humpbacks whilst keeping their feet on dry land. It's so relaxing, it's different, it gets you away from everything. It's such like a, wee, a mood booster, you kind of forget a bit of everything that's gone on. Um, so I just find that, yeah, it's a nice wee hobby to have and different. The humpback's visits are seasonal, usually January until March. So I'm taking my chance while I can. And Barney is clearly happy here because he's been visible on and off for the last five hours. So I could be here for a while. Now continuing our reflections on lockdown, back in January, I looked into the frustrations of our ski centers, blessed with some of the best snow in decades. I've been coming to Glenshee for years and I've rarely seen the conditions so good. And of course, when the snow falls, I, like many other people, are desperate to head into the hills. But to see this place empty, it's just so sad. The return of restrictions meant the enforced closure of Glenshee and Scotland's other resorts, the Lecht, Nevis Range, Cairngorm and Glencoe. So while the deer roam the slopes, manager David Farkerson can only ponder what might have been. On a Monday, January, conditions like this, um, I think we'd probably have 1,500 people a day. Um, certainly over this last weekend, which has been absolutely stunning weather, um, blue sky both days, uh, we'd have probably had 3,000 plus each day on the hill. And it's the same story across Scotland. Everyone, the whole five ski resorts, we've all got fantastic conditions just now. We're all going to be in the same boat, struggling, after having a couple of bad seasons, and then this was our chance to come back from that, but the chance is almost gone. Frustratingly, the fantastic conditions lasted nearly two months and could have been one of the busiest seasons ever. The Scottish Government stepped in with financial support to keep all the centres in business for another year. But as a nation, we are a hardy lot and we've thrived in the face of adversity many times. Ewan's in Dumfrieshire to find out how one family turned their fortunes after foot and mouth disease ravaged our farms just over 20 years ago. 
In mid-February 2001, foot and mouth disease was discovered at an abattoir in Essex. It reached Scotland by March. In an attempt to control the disease, cattle, sheep, pigs and even llamas had to be culled. By the end of the outbreak, over six million animals would be dead. At the time, I was embedded in the southwest, reporting on the unfolding tragedy. It's now late in the afternoon here in the bunker and there's a, a sense of confusion here at the moment and possibly a sense of panic. My overriding memory of that time was one of despair and panic at the sheer rate the infection was spreading. And speaking to traumatised farmers at the road end because I didn't want to be responsible for bringing foot and mouth to their farm. I'm at Paul Dean near Moffat and Landward came here in 2001 to speak to the Davidson family. Not long after, their entire herd of pedigree cattle had been culled. Jennifer and husband Willie had just come out of what we'd probably now call lockdown. I had a very good year with our Solaire cattle last year, winning the Highland Show. And that maybe was the low point of the whole thing, seeing the Highland Show champion being loaded onto the pyre. But with the experience of it all, we'll be back and uh, hopefully as strong as ever. Six months after they found foot and mouth on the farm, things had improved and their son Alistair was looking forward to a life in farming. There's not many people my age can say that they've got their job, their hobby and their way of life all rolled into one. Um, I would never ever want to do anything else. And he never has. Two decades later, Alistair is running the show at Paul Dean, along with wife Emma and the three young children. Daddy looks a bit different, doesn't he? Alistair may have changed, but the memories of 20 years ago are still vivid. The cow that uh, went down with it first was 127. She was the first one through the gate in the morning to get fed, and then that morning she was the last one. I thought, something wrong with that cow. Took her up to the crush, and yeah, it was quite obvious that that was what was, what was wrong with her. So what was that feeling like? It was a sinking feeling, devastation. <laughs> um, but at the same time, you had a responsibility to get on and get it, get it dealt with. Um, you, you're responsible for all your neighbours as well. What about the disposal of your animals? Did you watch it happen? It's kind of hard not to watch it. It was right outside the kitchen window. We actually helped in the, the cull. There are our animals, we felt that we had a responsibility to make it the best way of doing it as possible. So it wasn't very pleasant, but we were, they were our animals. OK. Right, Alistair's right, father right, bounced right, back. So that, uh... And that meant new stock. These Salar Charolais Cross cattle are descended from the animals that arrived just six months after the cull. So what was it like? when the first cattle came back to the farm? Uh, it was a great feeling. You know, it was the best feeling in the world to have had no stock on the farm. And then in September, we finally got some cattle. No, I'm happy with them, actually. The cattle are looking well, and uh, they've, uh, they've travelled well, actually. Do you approve? It's the first time you've seen them. Uh, of course it is. Uh, it's the first time you've seen them, so uh, yeah. I'd made a good decision. They're looking well. We had a great opportunity to look at all our business, do things differently, um, and aim, know where we're going to aim for. So the were positives came out of it. You have to take a positive out of everything, every life experience. Uh, otherwise, you know, it'd be very, it'd be a very tough life. After the dark days of 2001, there's maybe a lesson for us all in Alistair's attitude, especially in our current situation. 20 years on, the sun is out, spring is here, blossoms on the trees. In a couple of days time, these guys, descendants of the original cattle, first back on the farm after foot and mouth, are about to bring new life into the world.
This time last year, during the first lockdown, you kept us all entertained by sending in your videos. We love them so much, we're going to keep that tradition going. Great stuff. Please do keep them coming. Details on our website. Lockdown has meant many of us have tasted the delights of homeschooling. But what if you could have a school at home? Anne's in the far north, rediscovering the story of the children lucky or unlucky enough to have just that. Sixteen miles from the nearest school, no bus, and in winter snows, no chance of getting there anyway. When Katrina and Ian Kearney needed an education, the solution was simple. The school came to them. And this is the school. In 1974, the BBC Nationwide programme made the long journey here to Loch Cor Estate, a remote part of Sutherland, to cover the story. Over there is the smallest school in Britain. It's got just two pupils and a teaching staff of one. In my head and in my understanding. The teacher was provided after the local council came up against the formidable couple of estate gamekeeper Jog and his wife Kay. How did you manage to persuade the education authorities to to give you virtually your own school? How did that come about? We didn't persuade anybody. No. <laughs> they told me I would have to leave this job and get another one where I could get the school easier. And I just told them that wasn't the problem at all. Amen. Um, right, back to your places then. Katrina and Ian didn't seem phased by the cameras or having to wear school uniform when it was just the two of them. The biggest place I've been to is Dundee. The biggest place I've been to is Inverness. <laughs> and what, did, did you like Inverness? Yes, it's all right. And Dundee? Yes, OK. And I never really saw all of it. I was just in the hospital, but I saw a part of it. Nearly five decades later, the children are all grown up, but they remember their time in the spotlight here at Loch Cor. Katrina lives not too far away in Dunbeath, while Ian calls in from Aberdeenshire. What do you remember about the nationwide filming? I remember them turning up and uh, I was not really... We didn't know what, really what was happening, um, other than they were filming for the smallest school in Britain. We, we knew we were in the smallest school in Britain at the time. Yeah. That's basically the way I remember it as well. It was portrayed as being very remote in the film. Did you feel like it was remote? No, it was home. That's where we lived, that's where we grew up, that's where we played. We'd been there since we were little kids, it's the only thing we knew. Our life was up at Loch Cor and we just lived it. Feral, I think you would call us, <laughs> Ian. No, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Looking back now, being an adult with kids and all the rest of it, the only downside was we didn't have other kids to socialise with or fight with, as my father said. Well, there's one thing that I want. Most children have, and a bicycle. I'd like one. Of, I'd like a bicycle. Yeah, me too. I we can sort of sort of half and half ride. We can't, so never yeah. mind half and half. We had each other. I mean, me and you went all over the place together and did things together, got lost together. Well, no, we never got lost, but Mum and Dad thought we got lost, but <laughs> we, did, we weren't really. We knew where we were. Was it a good education? Yes. No, I, yes. definitely. The difference between homeschooling and what we had was 
homeschooling is your mother, and she's got a house to run at the same time. Yeah. And where we were was a teacher who was paid to teach us. Basically one to one, one to two. And a lot of our education was actually outside as well. What are you going to be, do you think, when you get a bit older? Oh. Ian wants to be a stalker here when Daddy dies. <laughs> yeah, I want to take over. I'd like to be a secretary or a receptionist or something like that, but <laughs> I don't know. Do you want to live near around? Around here, yes. Yeah. Somewhere yeah, and near. I, and I want to live here. Right here. It wasn't to be, as the family left the estate a few years later, but the smallest school in Britain set the children up for life, if not in the way Ian expected. In the film we heard about your aspirations. Did you achieve those? <laughs> not even close. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I, I was going to stay right there, wasn't I? Well, that Where? didn't happen. <laughs> I'm a scaffolder now, so I've made a good living out of it, so that's fine. I've, I've got a wife and two kids and everything's hunky dory. My job is not too far removed from what I said I was going to do. Um, I do work in an office. And did you get your bicycle in the end? We did. Yeah, we got a bike guy. Yeah, we bo we're both was... learned to ride it properly and all. Yeah. <laughs> we can so ride. Aye, aye, we can too, half and half. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this week's programme. Next week, we're all about the glory of the Scottish landscape. We visit one of the largest bogs in the world. In the flow country peatlands, there's more carbon than in all of the forests of Britain twice. And so maintaining these habitats in good condition is really important, especially in this time of climate emergency. The discovery of the lost ancient civilization on an Aberdeenshire hilltop. You're probably talking about a population that numbers thousands living on this hill in the 4th, 5th, 6th century AD in date. And the timeless inspiration of Glencoe. What I like about this spot is the river, as it's bending in from the corner of my frame that I'm composing, it will work itself up to the right and that mirrors the shape of the mountain. So please join us for that and much, much more if you can. In the meantime, from all the Lammer team here at the Tensmuir National Nature Reserve, thank you so much for your company. Bye for now. <laughs>